have us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us, that because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let their bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> the Spirit of the Lord God is, is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And instead of a song today, the choir has a very special.
second reading, a reading from the first letter to the church of Thessalonica. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People 
illustrates this point with a simple story. One day, Covey was in New York for a meeting and was traveling on the subway train back to his hotel. At one of the stops, a man with four children got on the train. The man sat down next to Covey. As the train began to move, the four children began running up and down the aisle, yelling and playing. One of the children grabbed a newspaper out of the hands of another a second child knocked over a sack of groceries an elderly woman had sitting on the floor. The entire car was in chaos because of these children. Covey looked over at the man sitting next to him. The man was just sitting there, staring out the window, seemingly oblivious to the children's behavior. Covey assumed that the man was just one more detached parent, one who would no doubt raise kids who would grow up to be troublemakers. As the children got louder and more disruptive, Covey decided he had to say something. Excuse me, sir, he said to me. Don't you think you should do something about your children? They're disturbing everyone on the train. The man turned and looked at Covey and then his children. I guess you're right, he said in a distracted tone. I guess I don't know what to do. You see, we just came home from the hospital. My wife, their mother, died about an hour ago. I guess we're all in shock. At that moment, Covey says, everything looked different. Everything Covey had thought about this man had to be reevaluated in the light of this new information. It can be frustrating when we think we understand something and it turns out we don't. It can be upsetting to think the world works one way only to find out that it doesn't work that way at all. Covey thought the father of the children was passive and unconcerned. When he learned that the man had just lost his wife, well, his view of that situation had changed. This new reality called for new behavior and a new way of interacting. This change is called a paradigm shift. A new way of seeing a situation or the world. Perhaps those interrogating John the Baptist found themselves in need of a paradigm shift. They thought they knew what John was up to when they went out to make a mockery. As you may know, John shunned the worldly ways and comforts and lived out in the wilderness. He was eccentric, intriguing, and charismatic. Those who followed him saw him as a prophet with a powerful message of social justice and spiritual integrity. His tone could be harsh. <laughs> And he wasn't afraid to challenge all those who depended on those crooked ways rather than the straight ways. Those who rested their fate and fortune on the ways of greed or power rather than on the ways of God. And the powers that be in his day grew uneasy because he was gaining in popularity. John's ministry took place precisely at a time when there was a great hope. Messiah would soon appear. The people of Israel were chafing under Roman rule. They were growing weary of their oppressors. And the time was ripe for reform.
John's announcement that the reign of God had gone near, combined with his call for people to be baptized in preparation for that reign, made it easy for folks to begin thinking of John as the Messiah, the one who might be coming to usher in the rule of God. And so the priests and Levites, we are told in our gospel lesson, went out to question John, to find out who he was, who it was that he proclaimed to be, what he was about. They were hoping to catch him. They came out there with their assumptions. John would have none of it. John knew who he was. What he was called to do, he was clear. He was not the Messiah. Yes, he had a role to play in the thing that God was doing, but it was just that. He was just a player, a preparer, a pointer in the right direction. He was not the main attraction. The one coming after me is mightier than me, John said. I am not worthy to untie his sins. And when asked directly if he was the Messiah, John meant, did not mince words, but plainly said, I am not. John's ministry and message was an effort to prepare his audience for that powerful shift of perspective, that paradigm shift. It's not about me, John was saying. I'm pointing beyond myself to one who comes after me, to the one who is already standing in your midst, John said. My whole life is but a gesture to what God is doing to shake up the foundations of the status quo. The meaning of my life is not what you think about me, but rather how you respond to the one to whom my life is. <coughs> if we have been paying attention the journey through Advent has been, a, been steadily moving towards a climax. The time is drawing near when we will celebrate the arrival of the true Messiah, the one true light, the one who comes to liberate the captives, to release the prisoners, the one who comforts those who mourn, the one who transforms the world. You know, if Jesus were to truly come again today, there might be a whole lot of people who might not agree with his agenda. In fact, there may be a whole lot of religious folks who might be facing their own paradigm shift. So the question for us today is this. Are we ready? Are we ready to let go of our own assumptions? To have our eyes open? To shift our perspective and our understanding? Things may not always be what they seem. If we can bracket our own preconceived notions just a bit, we might find a whole new reality below the surface. This third Sunday of Advent, we might also want to put ourselves on the hot seat, along with John, and just consider what role it is that we are to what might you and I be called to do to help point to others, point them in the right direction, to keep them focused on the one who's coming we await? I pray that.
prayer for each of us this third Sunday of Advent is that we will continue to watch and to wait and to prepare to be transformed, renewed in the light More importantly, that we'll discover and boldly lay claim to our part in God's surprising and world altering God. Amen. And to reaffirm our faith using the words of the Nicene. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified and Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and this kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who in the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us kneel as we are able. As we wait with joy for Jesus Christ, the one who is to come, let us offer prayers to God, who sent His Son as the true life into the world. For the peace of the world and for our unity in Christ, God, hear our prayer. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For Rick, our bishop, and for all bishops, for Father Wayne, Brother Ray, for the presbyters, deacons, and all who minister in Christ, and for the holy people of God, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world and the faithful in every place, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the nations and all in authority, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For justice, peace, and freedom among peoples of the earth, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For travelers, including Danny Mackey and Virginia Harrison, the sick and suffering, including Carlene Sanchez, Terry Griesland, Christopher Jerry Jones, and Stephen Pruitt, Sylvia Bullitt's mother, and all persons who continue to be afflicted by Ebola, for the hungry and for the oppressed, and for those in prison, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For the dying and the dead, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Are there any others we should remember in our prayers this morning? God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Joining our voices with the Blessed Virgin Mary and with all the saints and angels of God, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. God, hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. O Emmanuel, our King and Lawgiver, desire of all nations and Savior of all peoples, come and save us, O Lord our God. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, 
in ourselves and in the world we have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve all of your will. <coughs> Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Let us exchange your silence. <coughs> I appeal to you, sisters and brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship.
sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your, for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him and with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Thanks be to God. 